Magnetic nanoparticles might be small, but they've been touted by many commentators as the next big thing for all manner of commercial applications. Clinical science is a case in point. Here, greater knowledge of how magnetic nanoparticles behave and why is furthering a raft of investigations into promising biomagnetic technologies for applications like targeted drug delivery, gene therapy, and heat treatment of cancerous tumors, to name a few. I'm Joe McEntee, Group Editor at Institute of Physics Publishing, and I'm here today in London to find out more about this fast-moving field of research with Kevin O'Grady, Professor of Physics at the University of York, UK, and a specialist in magnetic materials. Let's, let's start with the fundamentals. Um, what are magnetic nanoparticles, and more specifically, what, what are the properties that make them useful in a clinical context? Magnetic nanoparticles have been around for a very long time. You can actually argue that magnetism was the first nanotechnology. If you go back to when you and I were much younger, you can find out that the little digital compact cassettes that we used contained magnetic nanoparticles. They were nanometric elongated particles of maghemite and iron oxide, which stored the information that we all deafened ourselves with in our cars in the 70s and 80s. So this is not new technology per se. What is happening is new applications of existing technology occur. The reason that magnetic nanoparticles are used in this way and have been for 40 years is the fact that when you make a magnetic particle very small, you change the domain structure to go from the normal domain structure you'd find in a chair leg, for example, where you've got a lot of domains that move and you have just a single domain. So these particles are correctly called single domain magnetic nanoparticles. There's been an explosion of R&D activity in this field over the last decade. What would you rate as the biggest advances in terms of the fundamental science? The biggest single advance is the fact that we now have better control over not only the chemistry of how to make them and control them, in terms of the fact that you not only want to control the particle size, but to have clinical applications, you need to control the size distribution. And that's a significantly greater challenge than was ever the requirement for magnetic tape applications or the magnetic inks that you find on the back of your railway ticket. How important is a multidisciplinary approach to the R&D effort on magnetic nanoparticles and especially the development of new diagnostic and therapeutic applications? It's absolutely critical. The problem that you face is that when you make a single domain magnetic particle, it has a permanent magnetic moment. So in essence, it's like a nanobar magnet. And we all know that if you had a bag and filled it with bar magnets, they'd all stick together. So now what you need to do is you need not only to make the particles and to understand the physics of their magnetic properties and understand how to control them more to the point, but then you need chemistry because you need to separate the particles so that they can act individually to provide the functionality that you're trying to achieve. And then to add a further level of complexity, you actually need to make the nanoparticle perform in vivo or in vitro in the way you want it to perform. You probably want the particle to attach to one type of cell, but not to another type of cell. And so therefore you need to what's called functionalize the magnetic nanoparticle, and that takes you immediately into the realms of biochemistry rather than simply chemistry or one step back into the realms of physics. So perhaps in this area, as in many areas of biomedical technology, you need the full complement of skills and there can't be any boundaries in this kind of science. Okay, go, going forward, what are the main challenges that scientists must, must overcome to create commercially viable and, and clinically relevant magne magnetic nanoparticle technologies? And, and what sort of time frames are we looking at? Okay, the first thing that, that one has to realize is that now we've developed the chemical technologies and the physical understanding. You're not going to find the position where one size fits all. For certain applications, for example, MRI contrast enhancement, which is already in clinical use, you need very, very small particles, down to about four or five nanometers. And that's probably the limit at which you have a crystallographically coherent material. If you want to do other applications, such as therapeutic heating of materials, for example, either to destroy cells in a tumor or even to enhance the effects of chemotherapy by heating, 
then you need very much bigger particles. You need particles that are 20 to 30 nanometers. And remember that the volume of those particles is depending on their cube. So you're talking about things that have a volume a thousand times the particles used in MRI contrast enhancement. We are now in the process of developing these materials and also understanding both the underlying physics, the chemistry of how to make them, and the biochemistry of how to functionalize them to enable tailor-made, or if you like, designer na magnetic nanoparticles to be produced for the range of clinical applications that are possible. Timescales, there are reports in the literature of actual clinical use of these particles mainly in the major research hospitals. You're not going to find these in your local hospital yet, but probably in the next five years you will. The rate of progress in the last five years has been dramatic in terms of tailoring, customizing and functionalizing the particles. You can expect to see a similar rate of progress in the next five years in terms of applying them in real clinical environments. You've just completed work on a special issue of Journal of Physics D summarizing the state of the art in magnetic nanoparticle research. Tell me more about the coverage that you've lined up. This is a, a rather long story. About uh, 10 years ago, there were discussions in a small way at the major conferences of this possible application of magnetics technology. And about five years or six years ago, there started to be an increased level of interest. And at that point, the Journal of Physics D commissioned three review articles on the subject because if you're covering the range of topics from physics to biochemistry, the one person who can write an article covering that breadth of science has not yet been born. Those articles, little bit of luck, were very timely. And what happened was that there was an explosion of interest heavily focused on these three articles. It's actually quite remarkable to think that a journal of applied physics can actually publish papers on biochemistry and chemistry as well as physics itself. And that again shows the degree of multidisciplinarity that's required. Since then, the field has exploded and we now have these materials being used in the human body. It therefore seems very timely, and it is timely, to publish a five-year update. Now, we've been very fortunate that the three original authors, Quentin Pankers from UCL, Poeta Morales from the Consejo in Madrid, and Catherine Berry from the uh, Center for Cell and Tissue Engineering in Glasgow University, have all agreed to write the five-year updates. And so we're very pleased to be publishing these in November 2009. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. You're welcome.